This is Neil Vokes, and welcome to the Variant Edition. Hi guys, and welcome to the Variant Edition, your first weekly video podcast show. We are your host, I'm Ricky. And I'm Mike. So, big San Diego Comic Con week. Unfortunately, we weren't there, but our little Nicky was. And he, and he met Stan Lee and wasted <clears throat> his time, and then we... Got really upset about it as soon as he got home from, uh, when we picked him out of Newark Airport, he uh, was Kicked him out of the car. Yeah, we kicked him out of the car quite properly because he rubbed it in our faces. Uh, but beyond the point, as you could see, huge Civil War week. We have a lot to talk about with that. We have two weeks of 52 to come back on. Um, all in all, just a big week. We have uh, Bowens that me and Mr. Swiss Stack will be covering. And, uh, Mike, what are you covering this week? I'm taking a look at a couple comics, which would include uh, Hawkgirl mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, I plum forgot what the other one was. The Bottom Feeders. The Bottom Feeders, The yeah. Bottom Feeders. So, with that in mind, we have a lot of show to get to, so here's Nick with the news. Hi, I'm Nick, and this is the news for the week of July 26th, 2006. This past weekend saw hordes of comic book fans descend upon San Diego, and as a result, we have tons of news. Let's get right to it. So, if you were paying attention to the news anywhere in comicdom, you'll already know that the San Diego Comic Con was held this past weekend. Early attendance estimates by con organizers are being pegged at close to 125,000. The robust attendance caused organizers to close registration on Saturday, in fears of a repeat of its winter's New York Comic Con, with the fire marshals closing the doors. But that didn't happen, and fans and creators alike got to participate in what many call the Geek Prom. Publishers took full advantage of the attention at the con and announced as many new projects as they could fit into their crowded panels. DC will launch another All-Star series, and to the surprise of few, expect it to be All-Star Wonder Woman by Adam Hughes sometime in 2007. Paul Dini will produce a Black Canary Zatanna hardcover graphic novel with art by Amanda Connor. Wildstorm announced that they had acquired the rights to publish a Nightmare on Elm Street, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Friday the 13th, and we will see a release starting in October. Brian K. Vaughn's Pride of Baghdad graphic novel will be released in September. Pride of Baghdad is inspired by a true story of four lions who escaped from Baghdad during the U.S. invasion. Also expect issue 50 of Why the Last Man to show who or what caused the plague that killed all the men. IDW will adapt Transformers the movie. Originally adapted by Marvel in the 80s, the new adaptation will coincide with the re-release of the animated film on DVD in October. Expect to see scenes and characters that didn't make the final cut of the movie to be a part of the four-part series. Marvel alum C.B. Sibolsky has three projects set for release from Image Comics, Shiki, Drain, and Wonderlust, featuring autobiographical tales of C.B.'s life as a teenager. Marvel announced the upcoming release of a lost issue of Fantastic Four by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee. Originally created as issue 102, only parts of the issue were released as flashback sequences in issue 108 due to disagreements between Kirby and Lee. This issue came to light as Marvel was preparing the next edition of Marvel Masterworks and contacted Lisa Kirby to obtain the original pages. They've begun work to finish the issue and will send it to Stan Lee to script. Expect to see the special issue to hit Stan's next April. Brian Bendis will join Frank Cho on a new Avengers title, The Mighty Avengers, late this year or early next year. Another lost issue, the sixth issue of Daredevil Father is finished and just awaiting inks and colors. Stephen King's Dark Tower is on track and expected to be released in February or March next year. Jeff Loeb will take over Wolverine with artist Simon Bianchi for issue 50 to 55. IDW also has plans to collect the Dick Tracy newspaper strips into hardcovers starting in October. So San Diego is a big convention with a lot going on. Last week, we announced that Marvel and DC were going head-to-head -head in a softball game. The winner? Marvel, with a score of 23 to 11. Over $2,100 were raised for actor. Variant edition favorite Tony Moore and Rick Remender's fear agent got driven around the con. Literally. G4, the network for gamers, Toyota and Image Comics have partnered to turn a new Toyota Yaris into a comic book by wrapping it with panels from the fear agent comic. The Fear Agent comics slash car were featured on the show floor and are a part of G4's live Comic-Con coverage. The Todd McFarlane panel took an interesting turn on Saturday during the question and answer session. Fellow image creator Robert Kirkman stood up and identified himself as a fan and asked, quote, You were really successful with Spawn, but what's next? When are you going to do another comic? You've got to have other ideas, right? Unquote. 
McFarlane responded that, having created his own Mickey Mouse and doing well, he didn't see the need to create a Donald Duck or Goofy. Kirkman was then outed by Brian Haberlin as the Walking Dead writer. Kirkman pressed on asking why McFarlane doesn't do comics anymore, and that his fans want to see him doing comics again. The tense exchange ended with a handshake and a counter challenge from McFarlane to wow him with a pitch and they'd work together. Kirkman was heard to remark that he'll be back next year if he had to, and I'm sure security for that panel will have Kirkman's picture all over the place. In other news, Arkea Studio Press, home to Mouse Guard, Artasia, and the Lone and Level Sands, announced their upcoming fall and spring line. October sees the release of The Killer, a bi-monthly hard-boiled noir series by Mats and Luke Jockaman. Oko Cycle of Water, by writer and illustrator Hub, premieres in December and is a four-issue series set during a turbulent time of struggle and warfare between rival clans. February sees the release of The Secret History, a bi-monthly 48-page series written by Jean-Pierre Picot, with art by Igor Cordy, Leo Pilipovic, and Goran Suzuka. Four immortal brothers and sisters are entrusted with ivory cards in the dawn of prehistory by a dying shaman. They are told never to use the cards together. The four leap through time, consumed in an epic struggle to influence and shape the history of Western civilization. Expect reviews of all these titles on Variant Edition when they are released. We've got so much news this week that I'll be returning later in the episode with more, but next it's Ricky and Mike Swistek with the Statue Review. Alright, so now it's time for our Toy and Statue Review, and this week, another Bowen Week, Mike. Uh, yes, big Bowen Week, big Bowen Week. I'll never get sick of it, ever, no, ever. No. So we're going to start off with Sunfire. Yeah, yeah. Now this is one I had mentioned, I saw on the website, and I was like, hmm. And the paint is great. It has that metallic kind of feel yes. to it, and it's awesome. It's limited to 1,800, and it's co-sculpted. Co-sculpted by Randy Bowen. So he sculpted. So what does that mean, Mike? He sculpted the base musculature, mm -hmm. and then it got turned over to an intern. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Here you go. Thanks. To do the texturing, to do the base, to do that stuff. I mean, that's how it normally works. I'm not sure exactly who did who what on did this what, one, but, but that's. He'll do the base musculature, mm -hmm. get the figure done, and then hand it off to a... To peon boy? <laughs> yeah, you know. <laughs> yes. For for final detailing and cleanup and such. Yes, and it looks great. Yeah, he's a great piece. Looks I mean, the great. thing that I like the most about it is the base. The base is great. The katana grip, the wrapping on it is just... It's awesome. It's awesome. I don't Worth really... Buy. I'm pissed I didn't pick one up, to be honest. I don't know the character... But I bought them anyway. I mean, I'm kind of getting every one of the Bowen well, busts. You're a, you uh, get everything Bowen, man. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great piece. Definitely worth your pickup. Tigra. She's awesome. The paint on it's great. Yeah, she's awesomely oh. sculpted. The 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 what gets me one of the little details that I really like mm -hmm. are the stripes aren't just painted on her; they're sculpted on her and then painted. Okay. So you know what I mean? I mean it's a it's a silly little thing, but you can see. Well, there's a big difference if it was just painted yeah, and then sculpted. You can see Absolutely. the it, it looks like a pattern on her. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? Jim Maddox did this one. Yes. And it's limited to, to two thousand five hundred. Yes. So a l little more than. Uh, you know, the Sunfire, but... One thing to mention on her. Mm. She's awesome. Awesome piece. But we noticed, me and Kev first took her out of the box, and we're looking at her, that the tail is real flexible. Like... And not attached to the base. It's attached flexible. to the back of her. I believe that it's not so much a cold cast porcelain as like a plastic resin mix they use. So there's a little bit extra like plastic for flexibility. Yeah, so okay. that you don't open it up and everyone has a cracked or broken tail, which I'll give them credit for that. They're looking out. Yeah. But at the same time, it does... It could have been attached, like, Yeah, it really could have been glued easily. to the base right back there and then you wouldn't have to worry about it because it's really kind of... It's real flimsy. She's awesome. awesome. I mean, I love the way the hands are sculpted. Mm -hmm. It's really, really nicely done. She's painted great. The, Great the, piece. The, the blue bikini looks awesome with her, the way that's slightly metallic. Mm -hmm. But she's it pops done. Off yeah. The, uh, the other paint. Beautiful eyes. The, the just really, as you know, with all Bowens, just really, really, good. really nicely done. So, that one. Watch the tail. Yes. It's a great piece. Pick it up. Then we move over to Snowbird and Sasquatch. Yes. And this is Rick Force. Yeah. Limited to 2,000? Yes, each. Each. This one came out first, mm -hmm. the regular Sasquatch. Mm -hmm. Then they did the Snowbird variant, transmutation variant. It's called. The they base did do, different. yeah, they did do a different base sculpture. The Sasquatch itself is the same exact sculpture, mm -hmm. um, just a different paint job and a different base. Mm -hmm. They're both really nice. I, I kind of, 
I think I might like the blue one better. We I don't know, just the way, the, yeah, the, the way it's... The musculature paint on it looks The way it's great. airbrushed is really nice. The bases, I like both the bases. I don't know which one I like better. The, 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 the... See, I love this. Yeah, the with snowbirds, the it's it. like oh. a cloud with like the, in, the totem Indian... Awesome. Uh, animals in it, you know. And some people have a problem. I personally don't, but some people I've what? I've noticed with the back of them. I know. I saw it at first. I was like, "Ooh, what happened?" But you know, he's a big piece. You're talking about all the extra sculpting that would have to be done for back muscle, and pretty much just fur would be covered. Yeah, that don't bother me. A lot of the classic old Bowens, mm -hmm. the original ones, like the Marv and stuff like that, had yeah. almost the same way. They really were more just the front and the back was just. But Bowen's got an awesome way of sculpt. Oh, these weren't sculpted by Bowen, but it's very Bowen esque. Bowen -esque. <laughs> the yes. style of how it's rough in the back and, but very nice, very nice pieces. It's silly to have both of them. I don't really even, again, know the silly. character, but they're both so nice in their own way. I'm a big Sasquatch fan, the real one. You know that's out there, not the comic book guy. Not the Still. comic book guy. Yeah, but these are great. Yeah. Definitely worth the pick on both of them. Then we move over to this. Now, we're this is our first time ever reviewing anything for Claiborne Moore, right? Yes. And, uh, wow. You know, this is the first time I've seen anything, actually, by him. This is yours, and yeah. you just got this. Yeah. This is uh, sh the Savage Dragon, She-Dragon. Yep. Uh, limited to 1800. 1800. Wow. I'm a big fan of Claiborne Moore. Mm -hmm. I've collected a lot of his stuff all the way back from when he did the Pit statue from the Pit comic. Um, he also did a the, the actual Savage Dragon mm -hmm. in like an action running pose, which that's probably ten years old at this point. Wow. But an awesome statue. Mm -hmm. And then I saw her coming out and said, "I, I, I gotta, yeah, I gotta yeah. get it," you know. Mm -hmm. it, she, she's beautifully done. She, uh, um, she's somebody, quite the woman. Oh, yes. Quite. Oh, yes. It's really the only complaint that I've heard on her is my wife, Jen, said about the lips. She has light green lips mm -hmm. with, the, with this darker green flesh. They're just like, they're like, just there. You know, like, it's just like... It makes her look a little uh, ape-snouted, but, ape I mean, snouted. she's still awesome. She's still <laughs> beautiful. Uh, yeah, um, her, uh... Posterior is fascinating. It's a good posterior. Yes. Definite good posterior there. She's she's really nicely done, but that's Claiborne Moore. He's he's not just good at sculpting men or women. He's just amazing. So overall, I mean, this piece is great. Yeah, yeah. Everything so, from you know the musculature to her other <laughs> her other aspects. Assets. We'll say. Yeah. Um, looks great. Yeah. You know, she's great. Awesome base. So if you get your mitts on it, definitely worth the pickup. Definitely. All the statues were great. Everyone worth the pickup. So, our 20th statue review this week, Mrs. Swistack, thanks again for another good one. Thank you. And we'll see you next week. Have a good one, guys. Some of these reviews may contain spoilers, so watch at your own risk. All right, so my first review this week is Cable Deadpool. This is Civil War tie-in, so it's a big deal, at least to me, because I follow the series, now it's a Civil War tie-in, makes it even better. And to start it off, Deadpool gets his ass kicked by the Great Lakes Avengers. Who? I'm not even entirely sure. But all I know is, this group of delinquents kicks his ass. And why is he fighting them? Because he wants to get a job with the government to be a, uh, a bounty hunter for them. And pick off all the, uh, all the unregistered mutants. Why not? Make a buck, man. Do your thing. But nonetheless, he gets his ass kicked and the government still offers him a job. Didn't make much sense. Okay, so beyond that, Deadpool does his basic comedic thing. It's good times. Now, Cable, you know, has a run-in with Deadpool and says he has a meeting. And Deadpool's like, with who? He wouldn't say, but we go to find out he, he has a meeting with Cap. Now, this is a big deal because it's very obvious, well, at least right now, that Cable is helping out Cap. Whereas he was trying to stay above it all and not get involved, that's very obvious he's not anymore. He's helping out Cap, you know, giving him the inside scoop on things. Now Deadpool overhears this, ends up going to um, a house where Daredevil is and ends up fighting him. And they're fighting, they're yelling back and forth, whatever, and they have a big, you know, fight. And at the end, <laughs> Cap, Daredevil, everyone that's against the... Uh, the uh, Superhuman Registration Act is there waiting to kick his ass. And 
that's basically where it's going to start off next issue. I can't think of a better way to do an issue. Comedy, seriousness with Civil War, and a great ending. This book, from the beginning, has been awesome. You need to read it. It's a great Civil War tie-in, and it's a must-read for the Civil War. Definitely pick it up, read it, ingest it, chew on it a little bit. It's good reads. So this week I read Flash, Fastest Man Alive, number two. Now, we all read number one, and we know that... Uh Flash and his friend were both in a very serious accident at an automated facility. Now, the odd thing that happens in number two is we find out that his friend, who has several, you know, badly battered injures, injuries on the inside, you know, all, all his organs are messed up, he's got cracked ribs, he's got broken everything, his face is all messed up, and within the amount of, like, two days, he's fully healed up and back on the scene. Uh, when they go back to the plant that this accident happened to, there's an, there's another accident, slightly smaller scale, and uh, you know the Flash is about to turn on the Speed Force, you know, retap into it and go save the day. But before he has a chance to, his friend starts glowing green and rescues the girl, and it's just very odd. Um, it could mean that he siphoned off a little bit of the Speed Force. I don't know what they're doing with this yet. Maybe they're making a brand new Professor Zoom. Who knows? Uh, it's a very interesting story. Uh, the art is still on point and just as good as it ever was. And I would highly recommend you picking up this series and picking up on the new Flash. It just seems very interesting. I can't wait to see where this goes. My next review is Ion number three. This is a series that I was skeptical on from the start. I was horrible the first issue, blah, blah. I went all on and on about it. Issue two came out. I started to come to a little bit. It got a little bit better. Issue three comes out now, and it was awesome. Why? Because you're starting to realize how out of control Kyle Rayner is with Ion. So from issue four, it comes out, and what a change. You know, from the beginning, a little iffy, now it's totally good. Because you're realizing Kyle Rayner as Ion is a little out of control. And why? Because Hal Jordan has to get involved. And if Hal Jordan has to get involved, you have a problem. Um, he's on some planet taking out basically a species, not caring. And it turns out he really doesn't know he's doing it. And, you know, it's how how Hal Jordan felt when he was with Parallax. They basically had this emotional thing, how, you know, he feels for him. And then he just turns on him again, and they have a big fight. This is a great issue, because now they're starting to... No more BS. I want to know why Kyle Rayner is, you know, eye on and what he's going to do with his powers. And it's very obvious, evil. Which is good, because... Uh, leaves to straight drama. It's going to be a great book from here on out. Mark my words. I'm official fan again. Um, I will buy this book every week. I will read it because it looks like it's just going to be good. Definitely pick it up. Green Lantern fans, of course. I'm sure you're buying it anyway, but keep reading it. So this week we're jumping one year ahead with Hawkgirl number 54. Uh, now I've been keeping up with this story, though she's not one of my favorite characters. But I've been reading it, and it's been weird, to say the least. We've been seeing a possibility of zombies and red skeletons and Hawkman coming back. A lot of weird things going on. Not to mention uh, this thing that has some kind of power with the eyes where she can bring out all the anger in you and want you to kill her, apparently. Very odd character. Regardless, Hawkgirl puts the smack down on her and, uh, you know, beats her damn near to death. And... She gets stopped by her friend who's the detective, even though her other friend of the detective died. Uh, it's odd. I don't know where they're going with this storyline, and all I know is that Hawkman is apparently back. Uh, could this be a good thing or a bad thing? I don't know. I don't like either of these characters, so to me, it doesn't really matter. It's just an interesting story, and if you're looking for something a little different that the regular uh, DC Universe is offering right now, I'd say pick it up. My next review is Justice League of America, issue zero. This is a big deal. They're restarting the Justice League. So I got my hands on this. I got the variant and everything. And like I'm flipping through it, and I'm like, holy crap, the art is changing. Look at, wow. There's like a million different artists that do this book. Um, Ed Bennis, who's doing the new series, did a part of it, and it looks awesome. So we have a lot to look forward to in that respect. All this basically was is how Batman, Wonder Woman, and Superman from a certain point said each year we're gonna have a meeting and we're gonna you know it went through each meeting that they have throughout the years and you get you know a detail of like say when 
uh, Superman Doomsday had their fight and he died, the repercussions of that. Every big event that went on through the Justice League's uh, existence is covered and you, you know you see what they met about, what they talked about throughout the entire way until you get to present when they're picking a new Justice League. Um, this is nothing but a tease, um, but it's a good tease because we have a lot to look forward to. I'm way interested to see who the new Justice League is going to be. There's a ton of people out there they could choose from. Um, I'm just hoping they don't go with some of the lamer characters, and I'm sure we all agree on who they are. But uh, we have a lot to look forward to with this. Ed Bennis artwork looks awesome. Um, I'm going to buy it, as well as probably everyone else is. So be on the lookout for issue one. It comes out soon, and it looks like it's going to be a great read. I also took a look at Birds of Prey number 96, and this was an interesting and yet uneventful storyline. Um, uh, the Black Canary's uh, adopted daughter really likes pancakes, and uh, Ted Cord is an amazing character, and they build a monument. Why it's a angel for Ted Cord, I don't really know. I thought they'd do more of a Blue Beetle thing, but that's all right, because later on, as the story progresses, you find that they are talking about making a Blue Beetle monument, just like they did for when Superman died. Um, seeing as how Blue Beetle was a major character, I think this would be an important choice for the series to go, just to erect a new monument to one of its fallen heroes. Uh, the other, only other thing you need to know about this is that Black Alice is back and just beating Birds of Prey, smacking them around, and she's got at the end of the at the end of this issue, you have Black Alice taking on Wonder Girl's powers uh, with the golden lasso around Black Canary's neck, hanging from a tree, and she's basically lynching her while three villains from the society are looking on. Uh, Minor characters, bottom feeders in the long run here, but, you know, stuff is happening and it's important on the mystic level of the DC Universe. I'd say pick this up if you're not familiar with Birds of Prey, because this is a brand new story arc and you can pick up from here on. Alright, so now, my favorite portion of the show, discussion. And this week was a huge week. We have Civil War and we have two issues of 52. What do you have to say about 52, Mike? Well, Batwoman is a lesbian. So on so to Civil, Civil War! War. Okay. <laughs> um, now, this is an issue that had relevance. Unlike Many important other things, things happened. It was uh, very Huge. groundbreaking in a lot of ways. Now, if you noticed, we had an extra variant this week. You know, normally it's just the Turner variant and then the Sketch Turner. But Ed McGuinness had his Thor. Which, it's a great cover, but gave a little bit too much away for me. You know, you, you, you saw the cover and you knew automatically, well, I guess Thor's involved. Damn it! Why would you do that? I was looking forward but to just a surprise. Time, at the same time, though, when we did, in fact, read Civil War, mm -hmm. we didn't connect uh, Project Lightning with Thor in the slightest. It's true, but, you know, you, knew, you saw it coming by that cover. And it was a little irritating, but I got over it because I bought the variant. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm an idiot. But that's beyond the point. This book was amazing. You're getting characters involved that you wouldn't even think would be involved. And I think that's what Marvel's trying to accomplish here. Bishop having a big part, well, we're assuming somewhat of a big part going on. Cable, which in my review, I let you guys know of, you know, he's kind of helping out Cap. Deadpool. But, but does that mean that he's on Cap's side necessarily? We don't know. We're also seeing Deadpool, who's been a mercenary for as long as anyone can remember, taking out a government contract. But he's doing it in a really bad way. He's just... That's he has no idea thing. who he's going after in the slightest. In the slightest. The other thing that we noticed was Cap fell into this trap that they set up very easily. Like, a little you, you too easily. You figured that Cable would, you know, be able to put together this, this company that got exploded, you know, mm -hmm. with Stark Industries. Uh, what, can't you just, like, Google that at home or something? He's from the future! Well, I'm sure Google is way more powerful in the future. I'm sure. Because then you can just Absolutely. check anything. Absolutely. You know, quantum physics, I don't know. No, it's there. Everything's there. But how about the throwdown between Iron Man and Cap? That was huge. Not only did Cap outwit Iron Man, you know, he put that sensor on him, it shorted out his... Nick Fury's bolt. nice little toy, yeah, that was amazing. That was good. Sh shorted him out, he went to sleep for a while, woke back up, and he woke up pissed. A little bit. He nearly, probably... Probably nearly killed almost Cap. Almost. Almost. He was giving him a pummeling. And I think that, that this issue just basically saw how each side is just relentless. How it's going to be throughout the rest of the issues. How dead serious they are. Because when two best friends that have been on the same team forever 
could nearly kill each other, I think there's a little bit of problems. Well, that and we also discussed uh, the other day how um, it's odd that Thor would be on Iron Man's side. Well, we, you know, Thor just shows up, and and you know, we're assuming he's, he's on, on Iron, Iron Man's side. side, and it's very easy to assume a lot of things that are going to happen in Civil War, but they're not giving you much. Each issue is little tidbits. They're giving you little hints on the things that are going to happen, and then they can just turn it around. Who knows? Um, we still don't know what Forty Two is. No idea. Um, we still haven't seen the Fantastic Four disband yet completely. You know, um, the X-Men still have almost no part in it. They're still kind of, you know, they're dealing with their 198 camp thing and all that. So, I mean, there's so, and so Doctor much. Doctor Strange left. I'm going to Alaska. Can Bye. you blame him? <laughs> Bye. He don't want nothing to do with it, but can you blame him? You know, the two teams are essentially just going to annihilate each other and accomplish nothing. And it's looking like that's what's going to happen with the amount of hatred these people have for each other over this. So this book is just way to rebound off of House of M. House of M being a complete disgust of a book. It was horrible. And then to, to come back and have such a force in the comic book world and like seriously like take over news with the fact that Spider-Man unmasked himself. Well, we've said this with Kenny Amazing. Many, Kevin many times and it just seems that you know, DC did with their Infinite Crisis, what they managed to do was a bunch of small little minute changes that they're now kind of taking back in one way, shape, form, or another. Superboy's dead. Mm. Yeah. Big Whereas deal. Civil War, within three issues, has already changed drastically the face of Marvel Comics as we know it. Yeah. Or three issues. And it took DC... I mean, I loved Infinite Crisis. I thought it was great. I, I'm not going to badmouth it, but it definitely didn't have as much change as three issues of this had. So, you know... and. We still have a ton to go through with all the, the other side stories that are going on. Plus this, the whole Marvel Universe is going to be a wreck by this time it's done. And that was well established before this even started. But look forward to this book, guys. Uh, you know, Look for great uh, things from it. It's going to be great. The storyline right now, can it's extremely hard to guess. You can only theorize about what they're going to do as far as, you know, they were saying about switching teams, you know, switching sides on the teams. And so my thought immediately right now is that Cap's team is going to go down, Iron Man's team is going to split in half and free the rest of Cap's team. That's what I'm guessing. I'm probably hideous, hideously wrong. Well, I mean, the only person we know is going to switch sides for is, sure is, is Spider-Man. Spider but can you blame him? <laughs> But, hey, be on the lookout. Buy all the side stories. They're all great. I've never had a problem with any of them yet. So, But that ends the discussion here. And Now yeah. we're going to kick it back over to Nick because we have so much news from the San Diego Comic Con that we have to. It's just so much news that we couldn't fit it in the front of the show. So now at the end of the show, you're going to get even more news about San Diego Comic Con. Nick? Thanks, Mike. Over the years, the San Diego Comic Con has evolved from just spotlighting comic books and comic creators. The past few years have seen the rise of huge multimedia booths throughout the floor. Television and movie stars roam the floor, and companies spare no expense to promote their upcoming projects. This year saw no shortage of movie-related news, and most of them were actually comic book related. The biggest story this year is, of course, Snakes on a Plane. I personally got a chance to roam through the Snakes on a Plane booth and museum and check out the awesome rubber snakes they had. With the trailer played on a constant loop, props from the film, and these spiffy con exclusive t-shirts, Snakes on a Plane was one of the busiest booths at the con. But snakes were not the only thing on the Comic Con menu. Stars from the upcoming Spider-Man 3 were on hand to promote next spring's blockbuster movie. Director Sam Raimi showed new footage and premiered new images, the most awaited one being Topher Grace changing into Venom. Topher Grace admitted he was a fan of Todd McFarlane and that it would be perfect that he would be playing Venom. In further Marvel movie news, the Hulk has a director and a villain. Louis Latier will direct The Incredible Hulk. Latier recently directed Transporter 2 and Jet Li's Unleashed. Latier stated that the Hulk will face off against the Abomination, a former KGB spy turned gamma-radiated monster. Iron Man director Jon Favreau confirmed that Mandarin will be the villain of the upcoming film. Fans will remember that the Mandarin has long been a thorn in Tony Stark's side and gains his power from the ten rings that he wears on his hands. No casting announcements have yet been made, but expect Iron Man to open May 2nd, 2008. Frank Miller will be adapting and directing The Spirit. 
One of the most influential comics of all time, The Spirit was created by Will Eisner, one of the greatest storytellers of the comics medium. Miller intends to be extremely faithful to the heart and soul of the material, but don't expect it to be nostalgic, noting that it will be scarier than most people will expect. Shooting is expected to start in late spring. In even more movie news, Warner Brothers intends to adapt Doom Patrol for the big screen. Featuring superpowered teenagers led by a wheelchair-bound mentor, Doom Patrol debuted in 1963, the same year as X-Men. Producer Akiva Goldman will produce the adaptation with Adam Turner working on the screenplay. No release date has yet been set. Also expect to see a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie on the big screen in 2007. Check out Apple.com for the teaser trailer, which premiered at the con. The multiplexes won't be the only place to see superheroes in action. DC Comics announced that they are working with Bruce Timm and Warner Brothers to produce a series of direct-to-DVD animated features. The three announced were New Frontier, to be co-written by series creator Darwin Cook, Superman Doomsday, co-written by Bruce Timm, and New Teen Titans, The Judas Contract, by Marv Wolfman and George Perez. The animated movies will adapt those stories and fans should expect the look of the characters to match that in the comics. In addition to the Iron Man live-action movie, expect an animated series to premiere next fall, and expect the new Fantastic Four animated series to premiere on Cartoon Network in September. So that's it for the news and also wraps up Variant Edition for this week. Be sure to check out our summer reading special early next week. Everybody shares some of their favorite summer reading material. We also get a chance to watch Brian Quinn draw that cool Japanese demon he did for me back at Wizard World Philadelphia. And then next week we finish up our Wizard World Philly coverage with our walk down Artist Alley and our exclusive interview with Neil Vokes, who's a very nice man by the way. Be sure to check out our website for exclusive online reviews and our new forum. Pop in and tell us what you think of the show. From everyone here at Variant Edition, thanks for watching.